And we're starting a series. It's called Fight or Flight. It's a two-week series. We're going to be talking about it today, and then we're going to continue with it next week. It's something that I'm really excited for, um, and I, I get excited for these things because I, as I study and prepare for them, I see how it impacts my life and how it makes my life better, and I get excited about it making your life better. And so I want to ask you guys a question. If, if you're familiar with the, the, the fight or flight kind of syndrome, or there's a thing in all of us that triggers, and it, it triggers a flight or a fight or flight response. So constantly as we go throughout the day, we're measuring our situations, and we're, our brain is telling us, okay, fight, flight, our brain is kind of monitoring that. And I'll give you some extreme answer, or extreme examples of this. Like, okay, I grew up in East Tennessee. Obviously, if you're new here, you know I don't sound like, like a South African. We're originally from the States. But I grew up in East Tennessee, and we had all kinds of mountains around us. And so we spent a lot of time hiking. We spent a lot of time in the mountains. And if a bear, so we had, we had bears there. If a bear is chasing after you, are you going to fight or flight? Well, obviously, all of us, we're going to make the decision that we're going to fly. So what we used to tell each other, what we used to tell you know, groups that we would take hiking and things like that, we'd say, listen, you don't have to be faster than the bear to not be eaten by the bear. You just have to be faster than the slowest person. And so what I used to tell people is, listen, I'm sorry, you're the tribute for today. I'm going to kick you in the knee and turn around and run if, if a bear comes after us because I'm going to make sure that, that it's not me. So um, quick service announcement. Your microphone may be on. If you guys are, <laughs> my wife's face is, 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 going, is going crazy. Guys. Fritz, do I need to switch to a handheld? Okay. Okay, guys. Intermission. We'll be... Okay. Okay. There you go. You got me. You got me. Okay. So, to get back to my story about flight... That, that's an example of, of using that in kind of the extreme. And I wish I could tell you that it was just a funny example, but that's actually real. That's actually something that, that, we, used to, that we used to do. Um, I'll tell you another story, which has nothing to do with this sermon, but I just want to tell you the story. One time we were hiking. This will just tell you a little bit about who I am. One time when we were hiking, we were actually charged by a bear. And I, we climbed up on top of this shelter, and we were going to just sit on the shelter until the bear went away. And we spent hours throwing rocks at it, trying to get rid of it, and then it eventually went away. And this was a sick bear, and a sick bear is a dangerous bear. That's a bear that will attack a human. So when it came time to sleep, these shelters are open on one side. So it's completely open. And I thought, how am I going to sleep when there's a bear out there? that could potentially attack us in the night. And I thought, oh, I know what to do. I just need to invoke more fear in everyone else here than I have. And so there were other people in the shelter, and I just planted the seeds of, man, guys, you know, um, if that bear comes in at night, it could just eat all of us. And so it turns out they didn't sleep at all that night, and I slept like a baby because I knew that they were going to, that flight was going to kick in for them, and so they were awake the entire night. So... And then, I don't know if any of you are instinctively, you know, respond with, with kind of the, the fight response. Um, I don't know if anyone in here, you know, has ever been in a fight or anyone in here has ever been even punched in the face. My dad used to say, you never know what kind of man you are until you've been punched in the face at least once. Um, I would say that that's not necessarily true. But, yeah, we're, we're talking about a man in the Bible who is the king of fight or flight. This is a guy that spends his whole life either fighting or fleeing. He spends his whole life deceiving or manipulating. And we're going to be looking at his life and we're going to learn from it. We're going to take away things from it that I believe are going to help us as we look at our own lives. Because in our own lives, we are fighting or we are fleeing things in our life that we need to actually deal with and address and move through. 
So the guy that we're going to be looking at today is a guy named Jacob. Now, Jacob is one of my favorite people in the Bible. His story is absolutely incredible. If you're not into reading the Bible, this is a great place to kind of jump in and hear the story because it plays out like a soap opera. And so to give you a little context of who Jacob is, let's start with Abraham. So if you, if you don't know a lot about the Old Testament, many of you know about Abraham. Abraham is the first guy that God said, okay, I'm choosing you, I'm setting you apart, I'm going to use you to make a great nation. I'm going to use you to bless the entire world. And so that's Abraham. Now Abraham has a son, so Abraham and Sarah, his wife, could not get pregnant. They prayed for a son, and then God gave them a son, and that son's name was Isaac. So does anyone here know the story of Abraham taking Isaac up on the mountain for a sacrifice? Yeah, you've heard that story? What's amazing about that story is that at the time, this is some side information for you, is Isaac was like 34 years old. Like when we think of that story, we think of Isaac being like a a six-year-old or a seven-year-old. Abraham's taking a grown man up onto the mountain, and God is testing Abraham's faith, and he blesses Abraham. He saves Isaac. Then Isaac marries a woman named Rebekah, and guess what? Rebekah also can't get pregnant. You know, I think Sarah and Rebecca should come to South Point Church because they would get immediately get they would immediately get pregnant. So so there's there's Isaac goes before God and he says, Hey God, you know, you've also promised me this. I you know, you've promised that we would be a part of Abraham's lineage, which means that we're gonna be a part of of just of you blessing the nations and you using us to bless the nations. And so he says, God, remember that promise. And so God tells him, okay, fine. And so him and Rebekah have a child, and that child's name is Jacob. Now, Jacob's story starts like many of our stories, and it starts in the mother's womb. It's crazy how much we're talking about the womb and pregnancy. I did not actually plan that, but Jacob's story starts in the womb. And it's really, specifically, we would not go to this for a normal person. But in Jacob's circumstances... Starting the story in the womb is actually extremely relevant, and it lays forward what's going to end up happening for the rest of Jacob's life and for the rest of this series. So we're going to jump in. We're going to jump into the scripture today. I'm, exciting to, I'm excited to read it to you. I want you to look at this as, as the, the Bible is so fun, and there's so much in it that we can learn and we can get from it. It's exciting. It's not boring there's drama, there's murder, there's all kinds of things like that in it. And we're going to look at this, this crazy story today. So we're going to turn to Genesis chapter 25, verse 19, and it says this. This is the account of the family line of Abraham's son, Isaac. Abraham became the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethel, the Aramean from Paddan Aram, and sister of Laban the Aramean. So you could get lost in all of that. But the important thing for you to note is that, is that Rebekah was Laban's sister. So that, that's the important thing to note because that's going to come back up in the, in the future. So, okay, we can go to the next verse. Verse 21, Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. Now the Lord answered his prayer, and his wife, Rebekah, became pregnant. So this is Isaac calling God out. Hey God, you promised this. You told us that this was going to happen. Well, it's not happening. And so he calls God out, and then God's answer is, is this in verse 22. Rebekah becomes pregnant. Now in verse 22 it says this, The babies jostled each other within her. It's amazing how sensitive a a mom can be as to what's happening inside of her. I know that my wife can tell you why it is kicking or why it's moving or why it has gone still or, you know, you, as a mom, you understand this on a level that that us dads or us men will never understand. But Rebecca, she's just like you. You can identify with her. This is a real mom. Now, she doesn't have a gynecologist to go to, but she feels something weird happening. She feels something different that's happening inside of her. And so she says, okay, I'm going to do the only thing I know to do. And she goes to prayer and she says, Lord, why is this happening to me? 
Why, why, what is this feeling? Maybe she's worried that she's going to lose them. Maybe she's worried there's something wrong. So she's like, Lord, what is happening and why is this happening to me? And so then the Lord responds to her. So the Lord says, two nations are in your womb. So this is not a riddle. This is, this is God giving her kind of a, a, a vision for what's to come. And he says, two nations are in your womb. And two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. So here's Rebecca coming to God, and God is saying, there's, there's two in there. Now, the older is going to serve the younger. And we can read over this, and we can think, well, okay, great. But there's actually something really important there for us to get. And it's this, that in, in Isaac and Rebekah's time, the firstborn was, was the one that had the family priority. The firstborn was the one that got the, the inheritance. So when, when the, the patriarch would pass away, the firstborn, he would get 50% of everything. And then what was left would be split up between everyone else. So the firstborn had the blessing. The firstborn had the promise. The firstborn was the one that was seen as carrying the family on and carrying the name on. And in no way would the firstborn ever serve one of their younger siblings. And so here God has told Rebecca something that's completely counterintuitive to everything that she knows. Now this is important. Because it's going to cause Rebecca to struggle later. But what I want us to get from this, from, from this statement right here, here's what I want you to take away from this, is that in this moment, a promise has been made. So God has made a promise. God, if God says it, then it's a promise. If God says something to you, it's a promise. It, it's not God spoke it, and then you had to wait on this. You had to wait on, uh, on a sign. It, it's, it's not like, well, okay, God called this kind of over my life, or He called me here, or I watched this happen. It, if it comes out of God's mouth, it's a promise. And that's something that Rebecca should have been able to lean on for comfort. But we'll see in the future that she really struggles with that. So to go on with her story, to get into the, the details of the birth we, we turn back to Genesis, and it says in verse 24, So when the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her, room, in her womb. So she's got two. So what God told her, there's going to be two in there. Now remember, they didn't have an ultrasound. They didn't have the 3D scans. They didn't have any of that. So she hears God say there's two in there, and then at birth, two come out. That, that is confirmation that what God has previously said was a promise. And so we go on to the next verse, verse 25. The first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment, so they named him Esau. So when they named people in, in this time, they would often name people based on a physical appearance or based on something that had happened. So if you read in the Old Testament, there's a lot of like Moses and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob of them kind of uh, moving throughout the land. And when they would go to a new place and something would happen in that place, they would build a little temple or an altar or a pile of rocks, really. And they would, they would name it something that represented something that happened. And kids were the same way. So Esau comes out probably looking like a gross mess, but he's super red and he's covered in hair. And so he gets the name Esau. Now, we go on to the next verse here. Remember, names matter. Names are important. When we name people, we tend to name people based on what we want to see them do. What, what they're getting named is based on something that has been done or has been spoken over them already. And so in verse 26, it says, and I, I switched over to the amplified version of this to, just to give you more context here. So that's, that's what's in parentheses. But it says, afterward, his brother came out, so now it's talking about Jacob, and his hand grasped Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob, one who grabs by the heel, also known as supplanter. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to him. So Jacob is given a name that means deceiver. 
So the phrase, one who grabs by the heel, that, that's like a, a phrase that was often used to, to tell that, that somebody was a deceiver. They were a trickster. They were a manipulator. There was, there was, they, they weren't very honest. And so here she names him Jacob because as he comes out of the womb, from birth, he's grabbing the heel of Esau. From birth, Jacob is given the name of deceiver. Now, that, that to me is, is something that would further maybe struggle or cause Rebecca to struggle to believe in God's promise. Because if God is saying that the second will be served by the first, but yet, but yet Jacob is given the name of deceiver, then how is, how is that going to work? And see, Rebecca, she really struggles with this. And because Rebecca struggles with it, hey, guess what? Jacob struggles with it. Parents in the room, your struggles, they become your kids' struggles. Your insecurities become your kids' insecurities. Your overcompensation becomes something that your children take on. And Rebecca was that to the extreme. See, Jacob and Esau, when they were born... Esau grew up to become like a manly guy. So he went hunting, he came back and he killed game and he came back and he would cook it and he would feed the family with it and he was an outdoorsy guy, you know, again, covered with hair so he probably looked like what we would think of like like a lumberjack or something like that, but he's the manly guy. And Jacob, Jacob is far more uh, domesticated. So Jacob spends more time at home. He spends more time with his mom, with Rebecca. And because of that difference, Isaac, Isaac favored Esau. So, and obviously, Esau is the firstborn. Now, Isaac doesn't know this thing that Rebekah knows. So, Isaac favors Esau. He's the firstborn. He's the manly guy. He's doing the hunting. He's doing all that stuff. And meanwhile, Rebekah is favoring Jacob because she's heard this thing from God. And so, she wants Jacob to step into what God has promised, but she doesn't understand how it's going to happen naturally, and so they, they take over. She takes over. She starts influencing Jacob. She starts just manipulating the situation around him. And so now what you have, let's fast forward in their life. You've got a story where you've got a woman who gives birth to twins. A promise has been made by God that the younger will be served by the older, It's counterintuitive. It doesn't make sense for the culture, but God spoke it. And so therefore, it's a promise. But you've got Rebecca, as she's watching the kids growing up, she's seeing Esau take those steps towards leadership, take those steps towards being the the firstborn and the one that that takes over the household. And she's watching Jacob kind of take a a back seat, and she's, she's struggling. And so she's spending a lot of time in Jacob's ear. And here's how I know this. Because when we look at the next story that we're going to look at, we can see her influence on it. So we're going to talk about two stories where Jacob tries to wrestle God, what, what God has spoken. Jacob tries to wrestle life. He tries to fight life to fit this promise. His mom, Rebecca, she tries to wrestle and fight with what God said and wrestle and fight with what life is doing to try and manipulate and make sure that that this promise that God made comes true. And so you have this story. The first one we're going to look at is Jacob tricks Esau out of his birthright. Now remember, the birthright was something that the firstborn had. This was like your your insurance. This was your your retirement fund. So um, the, the firstborn was automatically set up for the rest of their life financially. They would never have to worry because they get to inherit everything. Everything becomes theirs. That's what, that's what the birthright is. This is a valuable thing. Okay? This would be like yeah, signing over your part of, of the will that you're in to somebody else saying, no, I don't want that. I don't want all the sheep, all the cattle, all the riches, all the wealth. But this is, that's what the birthright is. And Jacob is going to trick Esau out of it. And here's the story. It's an amazing story. And it it starts again in Genesis 25. And it says, once when Jacob was cooking some stew, so Jacob's at home making stew, Esau, he came in from the open country 
famished. And remember, Esau's the hunter. He's, he's Isaac's favorite. He's the, the manly guy. So he's out into the open country. He's hunting. He comes in famished. Now, we don't know if he was out for an hour or if he was out for 10 days or if he was out for 30 days. But the Bible says that he was famished. So he was hungry. He was beyond hungry. He was like, he was hangry. He was borderline, borderline angry here. And in verse 30, it goes on, and he says to Jacob, quick. So not only is he hungry, he's, 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 he's I, I want this now. Give me this right now. I have to get this food into my body right now. I'm ready for it now. And so he says, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. Now, it's interesting here. That is why, so Esau was also called Edom, which also means red. So Esau comes out red, therefore he gets the name red. He, he's called Edom, which means red. And then Jacob is making a red stew. Now, I, I don't have a spiritual point behind that, but I just find it interesting that that color runs through Esau's life. So we go on to the next verse. Jacob replied, first sell me your birthright. Now, here's how I know that Rebekah has been talking in Jacob's ear. It's not like Jacob just randomly says, oh, I just had this idea. I'm going to get his birthright. My guess is that Jacob has been trying to wait. He's been waiting on Esau to be in a low moment, to be in a moment of weakness so that he can say, Esau, give me your birthright. Come on, let, let's trade. I want this because he's had Rebekah, his mom, in his ear telling him, Jacob, you're going to be served by Esau. You're going to be the one that... that, that rules over Esau. And so Jacob, hearing that, he's been thinking about this. He's been conspiring about this. This is not a random thing. And so he says, first sell me your birthright. And then he says, look, Esau says, I'm about to die. What good is a birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So Jacob's like, I want to hear it from your mouth that I'm going to get your birthright. And so he swore an oath to him selling his birthright to Jacob. And then we go on to the next verse. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. So there's a whole message in there where I could talk about Esau and what it's like because so many of us give up our birthright from God for a bowl of stew, but I don't have time to go into that. So I'm going to focus on Jacob, but Jacob now has tricked Esau. He now has Esau's birthright. Now, I just want to explain this. Esau despised his birthright. If you're Esau, you know that God has promised Abraham that Abraham will be a great nation. Abraham, his descendants will take over a land. His descendants will be a blessing to the entire world. Isaac knew that. That's why Isaac prayed for a son. Esau is the first firstborn from Abraham's line that doesn't pray for that, that's not interested in that. In fact, he's so uninterested in it that he trades his birthright for stew. And that's why in the Bible it says that Esau despised his birthright because he didn't value his position, that he was the firstborn, that he could continue God's promise. And so when God said the second would be served by the older, it was because he knew that Jacob could carry the promise and the vision but Esau would not. He would choose not to do that. Now, the second story that we'll look at, and we're going to look at this one quickly, is this story of Jacob stealing Esau's blessing. So I'm going to set the scene for you. Isaac, his dad, is old. Isaac is, is, a, is an old guy. He's on his deathbed. And so in, in kind of a theatrical way, Isaac says, I want to give my blessing. I'm ready to give my blessing to the firstborn. I'm ready to, to have a final meal and give a blessing to Esau. So he calls Esau in and he says, Esau, I want you to go out and I want you to kill an animal and bring it back and make me some of your stew. And I love the stew that you make. And when you do that, I'm going to then give you this blessing. I'm going to give you the, the blessing owed to the firstborn. And so Esau, he goes out to do that. Meanwhile, Rebecca hears about this, and Rebecca works her magic behind the scenes, and she sets Jacob up. She dresses Jacob in fur so that he feels like Esau. 
She puts Esau's clothes on him so that he smells like Esau. She makes the stew for him because she knew what Isaac wanted in this stew. And she gives the stew to Jacob. Jacob comes into his father's room and says, I'm Esau. His father tests him. He feels his hand. He feels how hairy he is. Poor Esau. Can't imagine how hairy he would be. Because Jacob's wearing an animal skin. Esau feels it and says, okay, now you feel like Esau. You smell like Esau, but you sound like Jacob. But he says, okay, I'm going to give you this blessing. And he does. Jacob gets the blessing from, from his dad. Now Jacob has the birthright, and he has the blessing. And this, this all comes because they could not believe in God's promise. And in fact, see, Rachel and Jacob... Remember, they already had the promise. They, they had this promise from God. They didn't have to do all of this. But because they did all of this, because they took matters in their own hands, like we do oftentimes, how many of us have had a promise? Or we feel like God has spoken something over our lives? Or, or maybe just you've had a word of affirmation given to you, or you felt like there's been a word of affirmation set aside for you, and you're waiting on it to happen. You're waiting on it to come true, but it doesn't. And so you, what you do is you start to manipulate your circumstances around that so that the thing that was spoken over you or the thing that was said to you would come true. So because of this, because Rebecca and Jacob could not trust on God's promise, Jacob would spend the next 20 years of his life in a fighting position. Jacob would have to leave his brother Esau so he leaves Esau. He has to flee because Esau says, next time I see you, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to murder you. So yeah, Jacob's got the birthright and the blessing, but now he doesn't have a home. So Rebekah sends him off to see Laban, her brother. And Jacob goes there. He ends up finding a wife. He, or he finds a woman that he's in love with. And he goes to Laban's household and she's there. And he says, hey, you know, give her me in marriage. Like, I, I love her. He found her beautiful. Jacob uh, and, and Laban says, okay, fine. Work for me for seven years and then you can have her. And so he does. He works for seven years. And then they have the wedding ceremony. But, and I don't understand the logistics behind this. But instead of Rachel, the one that Jacob loved being brought into Jacob, Leah was brought in. But Jacob didn't realize it until the next morning. So imagine that. He wakes up in the morning and he's like, wait a minute, you're not Rachel. <laughs> but the marriage has already been consummated. And so Jacob, again, I don't get the logistics of it, but Jacob wakes up and he's like, this is not the agreement that we had. So he goes to Laban and Laban says, I can't give you the second born until I give the first born. The second born can't be married until the first born is married. See, there's more of that firstborn, secondborn thing. It, it's so deeply in their culture. And so what, what ends up happening with Jacob is he has to work another seven years to get Rachel. And he does. And in those years, Jacob amasses a huge amount of wealth. And he amasses this huge herd. And it becomes so powerful and threatening to Laban that Laban goes after him. And so him and Laban have this kind of tussle, and you can read about it, and it's, it's, a, it's amazingly interesting because Laban tries to trick him. Laban's also a deceiver, and so now you've got two deceiving manipulators trying to outdo each other. It would make a great TV show today. And, and what it results in is Jacob spending 20 years in a fighting stance when he never actually had to. See, God's promises, remember, Jacob was given a promise. God's promises don't mean that your life will not be messy. You know, we like to say, well, God will never give me more than I can handle. You know, you may find yourself in a situation where, where you know, you're kind of in a mess. Life is kind of a mess. And you can think, man, God's not going to give me more than I can handle. And that's true. God will not give you more than you can handle. But what God will do is He will let your life fall apart. He will let your life become a mess. Now, if you're in that position now, where life has kind of fallen apart, where life feels kind of like a mess, I don't want you to get discouraged because, well, why did God let me get in this place? Why did, why did this have to happen? But I, I want you to understand why God lets this happen. 
And I want you to ask yourself in your seat and in your life right now, if, if you're in this place, if life is messy. Now, here's why God will let your life get messy. Here's why He'll let you kind of feel overwhelmed about life. Because He wants you to choose Him. And He wants you to understand that you need Him. And so, if God were to, to put bumpers around you and never let you skid a knee or never let you bump a knee or never let you encounter a struggle or a problem or made sure that everything was rosy for your entire life and you never had a mess in your life, then how would you know the goodness of God? How would you know the grace of God, the forgiveness of God? How would you know the restoration of God? Now, it breaks God's heart when He finds us in a messy place in life. It kills God. But... He wants you to know how much He loves you and how good He is. And so He lets you struggle. He lets life get a little bit messy. But He'll never leave you there. And we're going to see this as we work through Jacob's life. In fact, the next thing that happens in Jacob's life is he has an unavoidable encounter with Esau. And it's because of this unavoidable, unavoidable encounter that he has to come to to reality. He's got to face his reality head on, face to face. Because finally, Esau can no longer deceive. He can no longer lie. He's in a situation where he's stuck. Jacob is stuck in between Laban's house and home. He's got nowhere to go. And he's got to march home. And what's waiting at home for him is a man that said, the next time I see you, I'll end your life and I'll kill you. And so Jacob gets pushed to a place where he prays this prayer to God. And we see this in Genesis 32. Then Jacob prayed, O oh God, my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac. Jacob's buttering God up here. He's like, oh God, you're amazing. Lord, you who said to me, go back to your country and your relatives and I will make you prosper. I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan, but now I have become two camps. So what Jacob is doing here, he's buttering up to God. He's reminding God, God, remember, you made a promise. Remember, God, when I got here, all I had was, was a staff with me. It's like we come to God and we say, God, you know, all, this is all I had. Of course, I had to manipulate or I had to deceive or I had to fight. I had to be a fighter for everything that I have because I had nothing. Now, remember, God, you called me here. Remember, God, you, you asked me to do this. And Jacob goes on in his, in his prayer and he says, save me. This is the first time that Jacob has uttered these words. Because up until this point, it's always been, I can save myself. I can manipulate my, my, my situation. I can do it. And he says, save me. I pray from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid he will come and attack me. Also, remember, I have moms and children with me. But you have said, I will surely make you prosper and will make your descendants like the sand of the sea. What Jacob's doing here is Jacob's tricks and, and all of his, his contingency plans, they, they still continue. Even in this prayer to God, Jacob is trying to manipulate the situation. He, he's trying to make sure that that God knows he's got women and children with him because surely God won't let women and children die. I mean, Jacob is going to great lengths here. And so Jacob then, he takes action. So he's prayed and he's asked God for, for, for protection. But then look at what Jacob does. Jacob, the master deceiver, the master planner. He spent the night there where he prayed and from what he had with him, he selected a gift for his brother Esau. So 250, or 200 female goats, 20 male goats, 200 ewes, 20 rams, 30 female camels and their young, 40 cows and 10 bulls, and 20 female donkeys and 10 male donkeys. So he takes like a zoo and he puts it out in front of him. Now, why does he put the zoo out in front of him? So what, what, what Jacob is doing here is he's manipulating this, this whole thing because he thinks, if I put these herds in front of me, Esau is going to see donkeys coming. And when he sees donkey, donkeys coming, he's going to say, hey, what are these donkeys? And the person driving the donkeys are going to say, oh, it's a gift for you. 
And then when they sees when he sees camels coming, the person's going to say, "Oh, it's a gift for me for for you." So Jacob has devised this incredible scheme where Esau is like wave after wave after wave of gift because Jacob is trying to just keep himself alive. In fact, he goes on in verse 17, he instructed that this is where he he's telling people, "I want you to be in front, then I want you to follow." And here's what you're going to say to Esau. Here's how you're going to work this situation. And you, you can go on to the next verse. So he tells them there to say, this is a gift. And then he also instructed the second, the third, and all the others who followed the herds, you are to say the same thing to Esau when you meet him. Jacob's trying to, to really lay the foundation for his safety. In verse 20, and be sure to say, your servant Jacob is coming behind us. For he thought, I will pacify him with these gifts. I'm sending on ahead. Later when I see him, perhaps he will receive me. And the, the whole point of what Jacob is doing is he's just trying to preserve his own life. Now, I, there's so much more to this story, and I, we're short on time. I can't get to all of it. I wish I could. I love Jacob's story. But I want you guys, I want to connect this with you. I want you to to find yourself in this story. See, what ends up happening as the story unfolds is Jacob ends up splitting his camps. And he says, well, if Esau takes one camp and, and, and murders them, then at least there's the second. And I'll just go with the one that makes it. So if I split them up, at least 50% of my people will make it out of this situation alive. And so Jacob is wrestling with this thought. He's wrestling with this reality. And then what Jacob does is he, he splits them up. And then there's a night where Jacob takes all that's left with him. And he sends them across the river. And Jacob sends them across. And then in verse 34, we, we get, or the next verse 24, Jacob was left alone. So finally, Jacob is alone. And he's got to deal with his situation. And when he finds himself alone in his tent, this is when this incredible thing happens. And a man wrestled with him until daybreak. God himself, in human form, walks into Jacob's tent. And they begin to wrestle. They, finally, Jacob's alone and he has to deal with with his with himself he has to deal with all the deceit he's come to the end of his rope and he's alone a man walks into a tent and we're going to unpack this next week but something i want you to think about is this it's easier to treat god like an intruder than it is to see him as a father who wants to give you his blessing see jacob is fighting god his entire life when he's got a heavenly father that just wants to be a blessing to him, who's already made a promise, and Jacob just keeps fighting and fighting and fighting. And in fact, when God shows up in his tent, God shows up, Jacob immediately fights. He continues to fight. So there's a Jacob in all of us. What are the promises that that have been made to you? What are the promises that you've chosen for your life? What are the things that you believe for your life? Those things are promises. They're done. Claim them. You don't have to manipulate your life to receive them. You don't have to to do anything to get it. You just get it. See, we, we want the promises of God, but we don't want to do that with the pain of surrender. Because it takes a lot for us to give up. It takes a lot for us to let go of control. And I'm just here today to ask you, find in your life, where you could possibly be a Jacob? Is there an area in your life that you're fighting to control or you're fighting to manipulate? Is there an area in your workplace where you're fighting to take control and you're fighting to manipulate it so that it benefits you in a certain way? How about in your family? Moms, dads out there, are you fighting in your house to take control? And the areas in your life that you're fighting, has there been a promise in that area? Do you have to fight? Do you have to take control? Or is that a promise that you can just lean on? I want to leave you with this one example. When two people are fighting, they have their hands on each other. 
right? You're grabbing, you're wrestling, but you've got your hand on them. They've got their hand on you, and you're in a fighting stance. Well, you know what else happens when you have hands on someone other than fighting? You, you know what else it could be? It could be following. Because when you follow somebody, you can have hands on them, following them as they lead you. You could be holding their hand as they lead you. But can I ask you, is there somewhere in your life where you need to adjust your grip and, and you can just follow him? Now, next week, we're going to talk about what happens when a man wrestles God. We're going to talk about what happens when Jacob switches over from a fighting stance to a following stance. This week, I wanted you to get the idea and the picture of what happens when we fight to take control of a promise or of, of anything that's been spoken or said over our lives, and it never ends well for us. We always find ourselves stuck between Laban and Esau, a man that promised to kill us. So I don't know who out there is stuck. I don't know what your Laban is, and I don't know what your Esau is, but you're stuck in the middle. And it's time for you to stop fighting and to try and adjust your grip and find God and grab a hold of Him and instead follow. And so next week, we're going to pick up with the story right here where we leave off. Now, I'm going to say a prayer for us, and the band's going to come out and lead us in another song. And this is a moment where I just want to invite you to stand, and I want to invite you to just take a quiet moment. The reason that we do this moment in our service is when you go out there, life immediately happens. Life gets busy, the phone gets turned back on, emails come through, you know, you're trying to get to lunch, everything happens. As soon as you walk out the door, boom, life is happening. This moment here is a moment set up for you just to pause and to reflect and say, God, what is there in this that can help me in my life? Lord, what, what might you be saying to me through this message? If you don't know how to have that moment, if you don't know how to reflect, then you can just ask that question. Okay, Lord, what would you be saying to me through this message? And so I'm going to pray. Lord, thank you.